Hey everyone, I'm Karen Walby Solomon, and welcome to What's IGN Crushing On, IGN Africa's official entertainment podcast. I'm your host, and I'm joined as always by my producer and editor Rebecca Barchers. So, this is a show where we discuss all things entertainment and pop culture with a new guest every week. We bring recommendations, news, and fun facts sometimes touching on the more serious issues surrounding these topics. Welcome home. It's good to have you back. I always felt like I had a giant tree standing next to me. And now that he's gone... This town, look at it. It's perfect on the outside, but underneath, there's a lot going on. People do not want that to change. I've never met anyone from Chile before. And I'm glad to be your first. She's Jacob's daughter. I don't think we should let an outsider inside her. Leave this the hell alone. The house is trying to tell me something. Why do I feel like he's controlling me from his grave? Your father only ever wants what's best for you. I always knew he loved you more than me. I thought you were different, Yolanda, but you're all the same. Carl, you're not safe here. She's coming to collect. That was the trailer for Damn, which is now streaming on Showmax. Later on in the episode, we have a conversation with the star of the series, Leo Vivier, who you would know from Vondelis, Feinskriff, and the new film, The Day We Didn't Meet. But before that, we have a pop culture chat with filmmaker Stephen Philipson about everything from the process of filmmaking to how classic Jurassic Park is to The Queen's Gambit and how to ruin Christmas the wedding. So here's our chat with Stephen. Let's talk about your journey with film. So what is like the first film that you remember like being like, you know, I love this shit? Um, The first film I can remember um, was, I remember watching The Jungle Book at the the drive-in at the Goodwood Showgrounds when I was a very, very small child. Um, The first movie I remember seeing in the cinema was Basil the Great Mouse Detective. Oh, yes. Um, I love that movie. uh, I remember going to see uh, the South African version of Jog of the Bushveld uh, in the cinema as well when it first came out. Um, Never been a fan of dogs, but the movie still made me cry. You know, I was a small child. It's a sad movie. Um, Yeah, the the movie that really uh, got me a little obsessed with movies was uh, probably... uh, it was around about 1992, 1993. Really loved Aladdin. That was great. Mm. Um, and then I saw Jurassic Park and uh, really wanted to make my own robot dinosaurs. So, uh, yeah, I got a, little obsessed with, got a little obsessed with movies uh, from that point onwards, right to the point where I was at film school uh, trying to learn how to make them. Yeah. So, yes, okay. So you say Jurassic Park. So what do you think it was about that? Do you think it was the special effects or the story? I must admit, uh, I was a little obsessed with dinosaurs at the time. Oh. Uh, I think it was just be- like I was the right age for that movie to like hit every single part of my imagination perfectly. Mm. Um, I think that that was it. I mean, also, it's a really good movie. So um, Leanne has never seen, had never seen Jurassic Park, um, and I showed it to her for the first time a few years ago. And I'd forgotten that the movie is really scary because I've seen it so many times. Like I know every every single beat in that movie. Um, and she's like freaking out because it was quite scary. I'm like, oh yes, it was scary. I was terrified when I was 11. <laughs> yeah, 
Like I said, it's it's like you can watch that movie over and over again, and like every every little piece is so meticulously crafted and so well done. And also like dinosaurs and knowing that they actually built robot dinosaurs i know like the big story that came out of that was that they used the cgi for the first time in such a way to make realistic looking dinosaurs but the fact is like there were real robot dinosaurs there and like that was the coolest thing in the world it's like um i saw so many people saying that they, they don't understand why um like why they kept on opening jurassic park but now seeing why they keep opening disneyland <laughs> <laughs> even through like the covid pandemic like people just want to go back they want to they want to live in in fear they want to they want to risk it all for the so you'll die tickets on special <laughs> um. <laughs> so um so so was that the point when you you realized like no i want to study this like this is what i want to do uh yes that was that was very definitely around about that time i i think shortly before that i decided i want to be an actor and then i auditioned for one school play didn't get the part and changed my mind um so uh, and then I, fi- i figured that uh, you know there would be a lot more people trying to be actors and people trying to direct the movies um unfortunately i didn't do the maths and figured out that you're going to have you know 50 actors in one movie and you know just one person directing it so it doesn't really work out the way you think so what is the first film that you made Uh, the first film that I made, um, well, when I was a teenager, uh, I got a job at my, uh, local supermarket, uh, and saved up to buy myself a secondhand VHS camera and shot, uh, an amazingly epic movie called Attack of the Mushrooms, um, <laughs> inspired by a Sylvia Plath poem that we'd been learning in high school at the time. Yeah, it was really, really, really terrible. Um, so terrible that we remade it the next week to make it slightly better. It was still terrible, but at least it was filmed during daylight. So, you know, you could actually see what was going on. Uh, what is the story? There really wasn't one, um, <laughs> which is probably its biggest fault. Um, you know, mushrooms taking over the world and killing people <laughs> in ridiculously cheesy B-movie fashions. Um That was that was the first the first uh, narrative I attempted, um, but then uh, by the time I went through film school, um, ended up with my final film school project being uh, a a medieval comedy about a peasant who tries to break into a castle and gets caught in the princess's bedroom and tries to start a revolution from the jail cell. Yeah, because I figured most uh, most student films try to take themselves too seriously and they're normally like dark and depressing and all dramatic mm. and yeah, so I try to avoid that. And do you think like? obviously um i've seen a lot of your stuff but like do you think that is something that like that carries through into a lot of your work like there's so many it, it's so funny because it doesn't take itself seriously and you a lot of the time you you use very like serious genres like your film noir one or your um, as you say like medieval or you know any all of those type of things but you the, your twist on it is that it's It doesn't take itself seriously. So, do you think that that's like a ethos? Um, I, I, I think so. Um, I, I think when when I when I do come up with ideas, I always try to make things that are fun, a fun to make and fun to watch. Um, and I think it's also just like in my mind, it's a bit of a shortcut because it's easier to get somebody to enjoy something that's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you show them like a one minute comedy film, they'll, they'll, they'll get more invested in the humor than they would if you try to show somebody a one minute drama. Um, mm-hmm. that's, I think that's always been the logic behind it most of the time. For a lot of like, I suppose, aspiring filmmakers, like especially younger people who, mm-hmm. who struggle to, to kind of, of how to get into the, how to make their own films. And especially like, like film school is quite expensive for most people. So what do you, how do you suggest that they start out and, you know, start developing their own ideas into film? There, there is a large school of thought that the best way to do it is just to try to pick up a camera and try, see what works and yeah, figure out what works, figure out what doesn't and try again and keep trying and keep getting better. Um, there's a, a YouTube channel that I spend a lot of time watching called Film Right. They've been going, I think for about 11 years now. Um, they they always their their motto is write shoot edit repeat um so that and that's a philosophy they're always preaching on there it's a very entertaining channel i would recommend it if you are interested in in uh all things filmmaking so um so what filmmakers would you say you are inspired by oh um there's a lot of them um 
well, the obvious answer for somebody who's trying to make uh, trying to make uh, short films and and projects with no budgets and no resources is Robert Rodriguez. Like back in the '90s, he was the he was the indie filmmaking hero, mm. um, famously making El Mariachi, his first film for seven thousand dollars, which he raised by you know selling his own body to science for a fair amount of it. What? No, um, that he he part of. He wrote the script while he was uh, staying in like some medical facility doing part of some drug trial, which he got $3,000 for. So he sat there like earning money for like taking experimental medication and used that time to write a screenplay and use that money to buy his film stock. And also ended up casting the person who was in the room next to him as the villain in the film. Despite the fact that despite the fact that the person couldn't speak Spanish and the entire film was in Spanish. So if you ever watch El Mariachi, just know that like the, the bad guy is just saying everything phonetically. He doesn't know what he's saying. <laughs> um, I mean, other, other people have inspired me as well. Stories like Peter Jackson, who started out making like, the first one was, I think it was Bad Taste, um, which was a alien invasion zombie horror film. That's like just very splatterish. And at some point, like he just, cast everybody he knew around him including himself and then he ran out of people he knew because characters just kept getting killed off mm. and they didn't really have a story and so by the end he had to cast himself as a second character and then at some point it's just like the final i think it's the final part of the movie is just him fighting against himself like that's um that's where he started and then just like about f- five films later he was making lord of the rings which is yeah i once went to a job interview for a, a video editing job and uh the person interviewing me asked me what my dream job was and i said peter jackson's um i did not get that job <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're honest <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and then there's the obvious answer. There's there's Spielberg. I mean, unfortunately, I, I don't have a isn't a Universal Studios nearby that I can just walk into and like claim an office as my own until somebody you know, realizes I'm there and gives me something to direct. Um, that's the legend for him. Um, but his work is always great. And I, I mean, I was I was a small child in the '80s, so um, you know, all his movies are out there. E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, even Jaws. I love it, and you watch that later in life. Yeah. But yeah, those are all great. I mean, I mean, you just list every filmmaker ever. If you ask who inspires me, I could start going on about like Christopher Nolan movies. Those are great. Love the Coen Brothers. Went through a huge Coen Brothers phase uh, in my in my late twenties. Um, I had a housemate um, who got obsessed with like watching. He decided like he's going to watch every Kubrick movie, and then he decided never going to track down every like Coen Brothers movie. And we did. We went through all of them. Um, yeah, so like Coen Brothers, their their early films are also quite cool. Yeah, their their first one was also made dirt cheap. Like uh, I think they they got Barry Sonnenfeld, um, guy who directed the Adams Family movies, mm-hmm. like Sonnenfeld. Yeah, um, he, he, they bumped into him at a party and they knew he had a sixteen mil camera, so they like managed to rope him in as their DOP. <laughs> um, yeah, like just shot it rough and ready, and like uh, yeah, launched their careers that way. It's always like a like a chance meeting, or mm. you know, it's always like a, a a story like that. Like they don't know what's gonna happen. I was thinking, like I forgot that Peter Jackson directed um, Heavenly Creatures. Yes, that is a weird film. <laughs> and that is a it, it doesn't. It's not like <laughs> I wouldn't think of him. But I mean, obviously, you know, directors don't usually look like one. Mm. Yeah, but I think that was that was that was a deliberate attempt from, uh, by him to evolve into something else because he'd mm-hmm. made he, that was his fourth film uh, as far as I know because he made Bad Taste and he made like a weird disturbing adult Muppet movie called Meet the Feebles, um, which I have not yet seen. I've heard it's really gross. Um, <laughs> and then he made uh, Wait, adult brain. as in like adult. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to let that stew in your mind and whatever you think, it's probably worse than that. Uh, and then another movie called Brain Dead, uh, which is also like the zombie horror mm. slash splatter movie. Uh, and they decided to make something serious. So they found a, a true story based in New Zealand and uh, turned that into a movie and discovered Kate Winslet in the process. Yeah. And Melanie Linsky. Yeah. Um, it's a great sequence in that movie where like the, 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 the two main characters, they're having... The, they they have these elaborate fantasy sequences and at one point they're just like running away from Orson Welles because they think he's the ugliest man in the world because they've just seen the third man. 
<laughs> but I mean, so much of that film is based on like their letters to each other. So mm. it's like a lot of it is true because it has that kind of. But I know, like, with Spielberg also when he directed um, the Color Purple was also like a mm-hmm. weird transition for him. Like now we mm. like, I mean, obviously um, now we know of him as like a, a he, he does a lot of serious films. But I mean, he was like the blockbuster king back in the day. He was like mm-hmm. the um, what is that guy's name? Michael Bay of his time. <laughs> that might be a little unfair. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. a little, he's a little more meticulous than Michael Bay. Mm. Um, there, was, there was a thing I remember learning in film school where they we were told that like the purpose of camera movement is to reveal and conceal. So anytime like a camera is either is showing you something or hiding something, and so I remember watching the. Uh, the Adventures of Tintin, which is Spielberg's mm-hmm. animated movie, and then he still uses the camera exactly like he would in in a normal movie, just except for that one ridiculous bit where they're like destroying the whole town. That was a crazy sequence towards the end. But like right at the beginning, when you first meet Tintin, there's the shot where the, just the camera just moves and you catch his reflection in all the series of mirrors, and just it's like the way it's just so like meticulous and deliberate, and like mm-hmm. that's very Spielberg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was actually I was listening to um, Gwyneth Paltrow talking about her second wedding. And or third, I don't know, but her, her last wedding, and he's her godfather, and he was just like filming the wedding, and and like um, Rob Lowe was talking to her, and he was like, "It's so weird. Like, why was he f-? like?" She's like, "That's how. That's where he feels more comfortable. He would feel so uncomfortable, like just like chilling. Like with him, is she's like, you can you can take video if you want to. You can do this." like no pressure and he's like she's like, he's like who thinks of, of steven spielberg as the videographer at your wedding like i mean i've i filmed a couple uh, my fair share of weddings over the years um i, I remember after doing it like quite regularly there was a, a time when i couldn't remember the last wedding i hadn't filmed and then i went to a wedding where i didn't have to film and i did not know what to do <laughs> so do i understand I it hands? and yeah, exactly <laughs> what do i do with my hands so what if so what films have you watched recently that you were like a fan of? What have I watched recently that I was a fan of? Um it's weird being in lockdown because everything's just kind of blurred all together. So we end up watching like a lot more TV series. Um and then just like movies that are kind of not really the- thematically grouped. So I mean I, I finally got around to watching Mank Day Before Yesterday, which was mm-hmm. quite cool. Um Did you enjoy it? It was quite I did. Mm. <laughs> it's this the thing. Like it, it, when it comes to people's taste in movies, like especially if you like if you're someone like me who's who's very much into filmmaking, and you end up reading a lot about 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 films and films that are supposed to be really good, and films that are like pushing boundaries and and things that are apparently great works of art as opposed to merely like popular entertainment. Um, you 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 read a lot about these things, and you think, okay, cool, this is finally going to be like you know, the masterpiece that I've been waiting all year to see. And then you watch it and you're like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I it's think enjoyable it, though. That's it, I it's, en- it's enjoyable. It was very interesting. Cause like, um, obviously I, I, I've seen Citizen Kane quite a few times and it seems like a very basic on thing to say, but I really do like Citizen Kane. It does have like some of my favorite lines of dialogue of all time in that movie. Uh, so it was interesting watching Mank and seeing like how they managed to fit bits of like the William Randolph Hope's I keep saying Charles Foster Kane instead of William Randall Hobbs when talking about it because I know it's the one character is based on the other and I just keep mixing them up. So Kane's in the fake movie and Hobbs is in the real movie. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, it was it was interesting seeing like how much of how much of like the inspiration for mm. for like aspects of Citizen Kane came from that story. But obviously, I didn't. I I didn't actually know what the movie was going to be about. So it was it was it was interesting. It was interesting to watch. It was interesting the way it was all put together, but it it it's it's one of those things where like it seems often that there's there's like every movie is two stories. So there's one there's one story about the movie, and then there's the story within the movie, mm-hmm. and like so like to the extent where like Citizen Kane, you know, it's a great movie, but then there's also this other entire story about the movie that people are even making another movie about. But then <laughs> that that movie has a story about it as well. Just like the fact that the the David Fincher directed this movie, but it was written by his father who like passed away several years ago. So this, this, like this movie is written like 
decades ago and like he got to make his dad's movie and that's like that's just a crazy story mm -hmm. in itself um yeah so that was an interesting experience i saw tenant recently which is quite cool i don't know mm -hmm. if you've seen it i haven't seen it okay i will not say anything um would you, uh, I, would you like it <laughs> i did i do need to see it again um <laughs> Like it's one of those movies yeah it's one of those movies. like it's a it was a lot of fun there was the, the occasional moment where like your 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 brain gets a little wrinkled and you're like what okay cool that just happened and then you look at it and like uh okay i'd like to play that back to watch it again but i don't know if playing it back would have any difference because playing it yeah it was fun it was interesting like um i i do like christopher nolan's movies um I know there's a lot of like serious Nolan fanboys out there, and uh, I don't like being a fanboy of anything. But uh, but but his movies are always interesting. Like I like the way he takes like just a, a weird concept. So mm -hmm. I mean, like Inception, like he just took the idea of dreams and like, well, if you're a dreams, can you dream within dreams? And just like made this whole other thing and like to applied weird logic to to something that most people don't really think about, like how time passes faster in dreams. So if you dream within dreams, and then like time passes faster on different levels and like like and managed to build like an entire story structure out of that and like that was really interesting and i think tenet is is uh yeah he's also like found a simple aspect of the nature of time and and just managed to make a action spy movie out of it like and i think that's really interesting and it's a lot of fun and also like as I said, with every with every movie, there's the movie, and then there's the story about the movie. Mm -hmm. And like you, you're watching the movie, and like um, I don't know if this is the spoiler, but there is a scene involving a giant like like seven four seven crashing into a building. And like if you know, like you're watching Christopher Nolan movie, you know, like yeah, that's a real plane. They're really crashing a plane into a building. Like you know, it's real. Like and that's you know, like a Tom Cruise movie. Like oh look, that's him breaking his foot. Like for real. <laughs> Yeah, those two should team up. That would be interesting. <laughs> Tom Cruise is like, and like, I think he's he's an underrated actor, though. Mm, yeah, I was, I, I, I do think he's a great, he's a great actor. Um, I remember reading something very interesting a couple of years ago. Um, because like after Top Gun, like he didn't do any action films for years. Because everyone thinks of him as like this action movie star, yeah. but he made Top Gun, became very famous, and then he spent the next few years of his career like trying to get movies off the ground that wouldn't have gotten made otherwise. So if you think about it, like shortly after Top Gun, he made Rain Man, which is like mm. completely the other end of the spectrum of what movies could be. Um, and a, apparently, a large part of why that movie got made was because of Tom Cruise's involvement in it. So you know, I always find that quite admirable, like mm. trying to get things made that otherwise wouldn't be. But he seems to have like a like a like he really does love filmmaking. Mm, like yeah. Making movies. Like he enjoys that. Like I mm. don't, I mean, like I suppose he doesn't even have to make as many films as he does, but you know, you just, he seems to love it. I mean, did you hear about that rant he did on the, <laughs> I did hear that. I did hear <laughs> that. When, what, because uh, I, I heard it start playing and I didn't know what it was about. And then once I realized what he was ranting about, I was like, okay. Because first think, okay, Tom Cruise is crazy. Like <laughs> everyone knows us. It's like, mm -hmm. like we accept this fact. Like he's a little, he's a little, he's a little, he's a little mad. He's a little different to everyone else. But uh, now he's lost it. He's yelling at people like, oh no, he's yelling them for breaking like COVID safety protocols. That's quite cool. And then it went on a bit while. I'm like, maybe he is still mad. I don't know. But yeah, he had some good points. <laughs> it was a journey. <laughs> So what else have you, what other TV have you guys watched recently that, that you enjoy, that you can remember? That I can remember. Um, uh, the Queen's Gambit was pretty cool. Uh, mm -hmm. I do, I do remember that. That was amazing. Um, I don't know if you talked about that on the podcast before. I have no idea, but everything, <laughs> everything is all in one. Everything is all in one, but no. Oh my gosh, I love that show. Like that that show was amazing. Um, I, so every every now and then, um, my wife and I will be sitting on the couch watching TV, and she'll just be like heavily engrossed in the story, and I'll just be like, "Wow, the lighting in this scene is amazing." Um, I do this all the time. Like every now and then, it's like, "Wow, that's like the lighting in the scene is amazing," and it must be really weird for someone because like while we're watching that show, even Leanne was going like, "Wow, the lighting in the scene is amazing." <laughs> 
I know that there's so many so many great things about the show. Like the story was amazing. Like mm-hmm. I don't, like they made chess interesting. Like I was in the chess club at school for years. Chess was never that interesting. Like <laughs> I can play chess. Like I have fond memories of playing chess with my father. Like you know, but like chess was never that riveting. Like you can't even see what's going on in the game, and it's still like like you're in it. Like yeah, that was incredible. It was also fun that like. Uh, that you kept thinking something bad was going to happen and like it never did the way you expected it. Cause like there's, there's that we're, we're so used to like uh, a lot of familiar story tropes. So like somebody walks down the stairs into the basement and there's a creepy old man there. Like mm. you have a certain set of expectations of what's going to happen. there, And like, you're just thinking, Oh no, this poor girl has had so much bad stuff happened to her life. What's good the, the, now this. And like, Oh no, she's playing chess now. Okay. That's what <laughs> <laughs> so it was like a surprise but it was a nice surprise yeah and i felt like the whole series was full of those like nice surprises it's um so true. and it was I, I didn't even think of that i was like i i was just as you were saying that i was thinking when she gets adopted and like the mm-hmm. father looks at her in the mirror and i'm like shit what is Sam mm-hmm. gonna do and then he just like fucks off and we don't see him again <laughs> and, that's yeah. and, that's yeah, that- and the mother becomes supportive of a chess career Mm-hmm. yeah they, they they set up they have this like this there's, there's like a serious level of dread like throughout the whole thing and you're like mm-hmm. they're constantly like building up tension you're expecting something to go wrong in it like i mean things do go wrong but never like how you expect it and that was the fun part yeah mm. i do like a good show that that um that surprises me mm. or or any, anything that surprises me that like that you know it's nice to watch familiar things like familiar tropes but like if something is is not as you expect like you don't know where it's going to go like i love that yeah <laughs> so we watched a lot of christmas movies over the last uh, over the last two weeks over the Netflix yeah. cinematic universe <laughs> well, they're all connected they're all connected <laughs> i don't know if you're aware of this did you know that like in the first princess switch she watches the christmas prince and then in the second one the people from the christmas prince are at like the wedding or coronation or whatever yeah it was in the third one there rocker yeah so like <laughs> but then so so the, my wife is a huge fan of of cheesy christmas movies and so we watched a lot of them uh, over the festive season um like and the year before and the year before that as well um but the ne- netflix has a particular brand of christmas movie where like the acting is not great um <laughs> the plots are very predictable and the dialogue is not particularly great either although kudos to Vanessa Hudgens like she managed Love to make her. the princess switch again a lot better than some of the other ones you know it's purely based on her performance <laughs> um so uh, my theory is that uh, in the in next year you're going to have like the kid the little sister from the print from the christmas prince and like the little sister the or the the other guy's daughter from like the princess switch okay. like teaming up to like with like the other Vanessa Hudgens from the Christmas night movie like somehow they're going to do an avengers thing you know <laughs> i hope I love not the christmas but... <laughs> night one though that's my fave uh yeah i saw it a year ago so i don't really remember it um didn't find it that memorable um <laughs> oh um, the so... christmas prince so i didn't even watch the last one i thought it was so like like I watch a lot of Hallmark movies, but even I was like, no, this is too much for me. Those were those are not really my vibe. Um, the one good Christmas thing we watched was uh, How to Ruin Christmas the Wedding. Ah, oh, yes. Did you see that one? Yes. Oh my gosh, I yeah. I loved it. Yeah, it was it was like a breath of fresh air after all the very cheesy Christmas movies to find something that was a little more real, and it was genuinely funny. And like mm-hmm. I, I did mention the acting in all the other Netflix movies, the acting that was amazing. It was awesome. I really liked that. Like it, it, like it seemed to. I think it was written very well. Like the, mm. like the storyline was solid, and like the comedy was good, mm. and like it's just so nice to see like a summer Christmas. Mm. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> not seeing these like snow people and like, um, <laughs> and um, I don't know, God, those furry hats and stuff like that. Yeah, let's. Yeah. Somebody is. But also, you know what I like? Like, I like South African mo- like shows and movies that are like not conservative. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, like she's like she's out here like she slept with a maid man, and they show them. <laughs> like, you know, like what? <laughs> it was so good. Yeah, it was really good. Even just for like 
I remember, like, I know it was really well written, like, great performances, great dramatic stuff, great comedy stuff. But every now and then you just rem- and you remember, like, you know, Desmond Dubé walking around <laughs> talking about the sheep that he'd named succulent. Like, Do you know, that was awesome. I was like, I, I don't know, I'm not high, but at all, because every time I, that sheep, like, barked and then he turned his head, I was crying with laughter. Like, I couldn't tell. And it's like, I miss, I don't know when I also seen Desmond Dubé in something, like, now I just see me in clientele ads, like, <laughs> like, I forget that he was, like, comedy gold in the 90s, like, yeah, we all I mean, knew his name. Yeah, back in suburban bliss. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, yeah, he was out there with Noah back in the day. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Oh, but he was really good in there, like, oh, yeah. it's so funny. <laughs> Succulent. Mm. <laughs> I want to talk, um, uh, I just want you to talk about like how, like your whole thing, I don't know if you want to make this actually public on the podcast, but your whole thing is you can judge a lot uh, about somebody about whether they like The Last Jedi. Because <laughs> oh, oh. I saw this to, on a tweet trying, today and trying to, and I was and trying, I thought about that and I was like, ooh. Oh, you're, you're trying to get me to give an opinion about Star Wars on the internet. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, it's just a, it's like a little a little litmus test. I I, I came up. Well, I noticed that like, generally I found people who had opinions that I disagreed with. Like that was an easy one to get out the way first, and then you kind of know like oh, okay, well they uh, if they don't like this, then odds are that they're they're like you know, philosophical leanings go in a particular direction as opposed to where mine go. Um, it does tend to be like that. I, uh, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to go out and say, I, I, don't, I don't understand why people didn't like that movie. <laughs> I've heard people's complaints, but I'm like, and? <laughs> it doesn't seem to make sense to me. I personally love The Last Jedi. I've I mean, been a, a big fan of Ryan Johnson's, mm. like, forever. Like, I discovered Brick once. Um, I found it at a... It, it was obviously it was something I'd read about quite a bit because um, there's a pattern here. Um, <laughs> so I found it in uh, in Cineland, the video rental store in Rondebosch. Like they had like all the odd movies there and all the old arts movies. Like and it was like found it there one time. I was there. I was like I was so excited to watch it. But then like the day the day I watched it, like you know you plan a day and time runs away with you. We ended up starting to watch it at like one o'clock in the morning. I'm thinking like, I'm probably going to fall asleep during this movie. And I did not. I was riveted the whole way through. I love that movie. That movie's amazing. Um, yeah, it's like a film noir movie, which I enjoy, but set in a modern high school. And then like what is now a very young Joseph Gordon-Levitt running around, like playing like, you know, a high school Humphrey Bogart. It was awesome. It was really cool. Um, and then and then loved Looper. And then... I must admit, I've only seen Brothers Bloom once. Can't remember much about it. But yeah. Um, and then after Looper, uh, then came The Last Jedi. That was awesome. And then Knives Out. <laughs> that was something else. <laughs> I, I love him too. I haven't seen as many as you have. But um, also, my favorite star- of the new Star Wars. So, <laughs> but also, oh, like, what? yeah, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like, so adver- like, I can't handle film bros. Mm, why I think yeah. I'm one of the few male film fans that I actually get along with because you just see patterns and then you see and you see uh, like little underlying opinions that that lean towards like misogyny and <laughs> lean towards you know other things that that mm. that come out I think that the big issue with Star Wars is that um, for a long time it was it was only favored by a certain group of people, and it was you know nerdy dudes. Like, mm. um, and then with the, with the newer films, they 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 did seem to make an effort to make them a bit more more inclusive. Like, um, and that was great. Like, but then some people felt like those the films were being taken away from them. That mm. at least this is how I've perceived it. Um, and it's not like the Star Wars they always used to know. Like, um, but I don't know. I mean, I think one of the, the biggest issue people had with it was that like Luke was a grumpy old man. And like, have you met old men? Old men are grumpy. Like, I'm almost forty. I get grumpier every day. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you. At, at some point, um, 
before before they announced that they were making the the, the new Star Wars sequels, um, I'd I'd try to like figure out what I would make as a Star Wars sequel in mm. my own head, um, and like a large part of my idea was that like you know Luke could be kind of messed up, because um, yeah, there's there's that ancient that no proverb that um, if you save someone's life, you're responsible for it. Mm. So like if Luke if Luke saved the whole galaxy, like he's responsible for it. Like that's gonna mess anyone up. Like. I could I totally understand why he would end up hiding on an island even without the the other backstory that they added. Like, yeah. So But that's not true though. Mine. Like like if anybody has been through as much as that character had been through, and I mean we the last time we saw him, he was like what in his twenties. So we don't know mm. what happens in the next 40 years. He'd already been through such a lot by that point. Mm. So mm. how much do you think that, that would have weighed on him? Like I mean, like, look at, in the Marvel movies, if you look at Tony mm. and how each of those traumas, like, how it affects him more and more and more. And mm. can you imagine if, like, we didn't see Tony for 40 years? How much <laughs> of a worse of a, you know, what would he have been like at the end of that? And that's yeah, kind like, of Luke. Even though Luke started out, like, all, like, happy and cute and drinking his... Idealistic. And, yeah. yeah, and all that stuff. <laughs> But um, the character, like, yeah, it's, it's a natural progression. But it's like, yeah, it's just you're not going to please everybody, I suppose. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the <laughs> that's the crux line of it. No, please, I, mean, I will say this. It's beyond doubt it's the prettiest Star Wars movie. Like, just to look at. Like, it's mm. like the way, the way it's shot. And, like, I know the next movie, they try to make it as epic as possible by adding as, like, as many spaceships as you could fit into the screen at any one time. <laughs> and, like, that was not nearly as epic as just, like, the final, like, standoff in The Last Jedi between Luke and Kylo Ren. Like, and they're on that, like, oh, r- red-stained snow and the sunset and the m- mountains on the one side and the giant, like, like oh. walking machines on the other. And it's, like, that was epic. It was, like the greatest Western ever made. And like, just there, it was beautiful. It was stunning. And like, it, it felt epic. And like, I'm, I, I pity people who couldn't enjoy it. And it has Laura Dern in it. Laura Dern. Laura Dern. With purple hair. Laura Dern. <laughs> yes. Who also did the single most badass thing in any Star Wars movie, where she just like plowed her spaceship through the others and walked back. Oh. That, like, that was an epic moment. Like I know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> how can you not like this movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm gonna watch it again now um <laughs> so okay let's let's do the closing questions what is your closing questions yeah what is your all-time favorite series <sighs> um my all-time favorite series um for a long time it was monty python's flying circus um, mm. I love the insanity of it. I love the madness of it. I always thought they were like TV's version of the Beatles because um, they were like just about as crazy. Surprisingly, not on as many drugs, um, which you wouldn't think for watching the show. Um, <laughs> Can I tell you about my introduction to M- Monty Python? I had mm-hmm. like, a game on my computer. This is like back in the days when computers were still new. And mm-hmm. like, and like I couldn't do much. All I could do was press on the characters and they would like say their famous lines. And that was it. Okay. Oh, and then, wow. And then when I had seen the, when I ended up watching the movies, I was like, I was like, oh my word, this is where it's from. <laughs> if I told you you had a beautiful body, would you hold it up against me? Like, would you hold it against me? That's the line. And you, I had no idea what that meant as a child. But anyway. But <laughs> is, is that from the, the Dirty Hungarian Facebook? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, my, my introduction to Monty Python was actually through the radio because um, Monty Python was banned here uh, back mm. in the day. Um, and then they released everything in the, the, the mid to late 90s. I think it was 1996. And, yeah, it was a DJ who used to play comedy clips on the radio. And every Monday morning, he would play little Monty Python snippets. Oh. And, yeah, so I started listening to those. Um, and there was a competition where they were giving away like copies of these Monty Python's Flying Circus VHS tapes. And um, I entered, I won. Um, I didn't actually answer the question. They didn't even ask me the question. I would have got it wrong. And um, I'd be ashamed to get it wrong because like, the question was, uh, which which of the Monty Python members in, ended up becoming a Hollywood director? And, like At the time, I didn't know that was Terry Gilliam, mm-hmm. despite the fact they ended up loving Terry Gilliam movies, like mm-hmm. 12 Monkeys. That's a great film. Um, haven't been brave enough to watch it this year, though. Um, 
It's about most of the world dying from oh. a disease. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I entered the competition. I won it, and then they mailed me the uh, mailed me the VHS tape. I went to go collect it at the post office, and then I rushed back to school for play practice. And like, you know, gathered my friends around around me because quite excited because I won this Monty Python tape. Ripped the packaging open, pulled it out, and on the cover was like a policeman with a pair of naked female breasts. And like, there I am standing in the school hall with this, shoved it back in the envelope. Like, no one saw that. No one saw that. Nobody saw that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, watching Monty Python recently has been a little, a little bit of an awkward experience. Um, watching it when you're young and naive is one thing, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, watching it again as an adult, there's a like a lot of blackface in there that I didn't like really realize at the time. It's like, oh, this is uncomfortable now. Yeah, that that was my favorite series for a long time. Um, I don't know what I would say now. Um, I'll say the one I watch the most is probably Brooklyn Nine Nine or Parks and Rec. Mm. love those always a fan of sitcoms so brooklyn parks and rec um watch friends many times over yeah okay and what would you say is your all-time favorite movie all-time favorite movie um for many years it was jurassic park and then for many years it was 12 monkeys and then for a long time it was lord of the rings particularly the second lord of the rings movie um and then i'd watch so many movies i couldn't pick a favorite anymore and so whenever people would ask me what my favorite one was i would panic and just say kung fu hustle Kung Fu Hustle is a great movie. <laughs> so, okay, last question. Who was your first celebrity crush? Christina Ricci. Oh. Yeah. Respect. That's like the arty yeah. film, film, <laughs> film answer. Well, I mean, like, I was, I, was, I, was, I was the young teenage boy when Casper came out. I mean, yeah, so. <laughs> Makes sense. You know, my first movie with her is a mermaid. I love mermaids with Sher and Winona Ryder and Christina Ricci's like the she's like the younger one. The yeah, younger. I haven't seen it, but I do recall seeing the music video many times as it was like <laughs> one of four music videos they played on SABC in like nineteen eighty six or whenever that came out. Yeah, eighty eight, I think it was. Yeah. But thanks so much, Steve. This was awesome. Thank you. It was great chatting to you. It was very difficult to stay on topic, but okay. Um. <laughs> we stayed on topic at all. I don't think we did. I don't think we did. I hope there's something usable in this. So that was our chat with Stephen. You can find him on Twitter at a thousand elephants or on Instagram at Stephen underscore Philipson. Also check out his YouTube and his website to see his amazing short films. The links will all be in the show notes. Now we have an interview with Leah Vivier. Dam is currently streaming on Showmax and it stars Leah as Leola Fisher, who returns from Chile to the Eastern Cape to bury her father. She discovered he's left his farm to her to the irritation of her sister, Sienna. It turns out this may be more of a curse than a blessing as the house seems to be trying to tell her something. But with her mother institutionalized and her own maids running out, Yola has to wonder if the spirits are real or just in our head. So here's our chat with Leah. How are you? Have you been during this tough time? Yo, I think it's been interesting for all of us, hey? We're living in a different type Mm. of reality, different kind of reality. It's very interesting, and we've all had to adapt. I've been lucky enough to have quite a bit of work last Mm. year, and this year I still have some work trickling in here and there. It's quieter now than it was last year. But my family has been directly um, affected by the pandemic and by COVID Mm. um, with regards to death. So it's interesting. It's a very interesting time to live in. And I think we're all adapting and managing it as, as, as well as we can. I definitely feel privileged that I still have work and that I'm still earning an income. A lot of people aren't. So I feel privileged and my parents are healthy and my immediate siblings are all healthy. So I'm kind of just trying to look at all the good and all the positive mm. that's still there, you know? Um, but it's 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 challenging um, just with regards to finding the new so-called normal. Yeah. <laughs> and you? <laughs> I'm okay. You know, yeah. still, still happy, still healthy. Um, yeah. So like you were saying, you had quite a bit of work last year. So how did you manage filming in and around lockdown and that kind of thing? Surely that was so hectic. I- 
It was interesting. I think, look, I think I was just so happy to have work mm. that all thoughts of the pandemic just kind of went out of my mind, you know, because in level five, when the president announced level five, I moved back home, not because of income, but I didn't want to isolate or I didn't want to um, lock down in my apartment. Yeah. My parents is home. They've got a bit of garden space. So I knew that I could run around in the mm. garden and they actually live on the West Coast. So it just felt more spacious mm. than living in town. So I moved back home. But I said to my father initially, like I was like, I don't know if I'm going to work for the rest of the year because obviously level five, mm. we can't work from home. <laughs> you know, we have to be on set. So I was like, I think I might have to go through an entire career change because we didn't know for how long this is going to keep on happening. So then when my first project came through, which was a project I did before DAM, I was just so grateful to go back to work. And of course, it's strange because, you know, mm. we sit in the makeup and the hair um, room or in the chair, the makeup chair without a mask on. But then as soon as you are finished or done, you put your mask back on. So you're constantly worried about makeup smudging. And um, you, you're very vulnerable as an actor mm. because... Yes, you can put your mask back on again, but the moment the cameras are rolling, you take your mask off and then you're exposed to your co-actors, to the crew, yeah. to everyone. So you are very exposed. And and really, if you if you do the job or if you work in the line of work, I, I mean, look, we're not medical professionals mm -hmm. and we're not saving people's lives, but we can't do our jobs without exposing ourselves mm -hmm. to the virus whatsoever. So... I, I have had very close encounters, I think, five, six times already. Sure. And um, my friends are always so surprised to find out that I think I've been tested now about seven or eight times I've been tested um, because of our line of work. Mm. So so there's you just come into contact with it. And then it's this interesting thing where it kind of becomes a no-brainer or you become desensitized mm. to perhaps having had the virus or not having had it. Um I'm sure I've had it a couple of times. I haven't actually ever tested positive for it, but I've been in such close contact with it. There's no way um, that I couldn't have picked it up. So it's this weird kind of thing between not being desensitized mm. and still realizing the huge impact that it has on people. And as I said, we've had death in our family because of COVID, but at the same time, still just carrying on, you know? Mm -hmm. And still exposing yourself and doing intimate scenes and all of those things and needing to be comfortable within it. It's a very strange kind of place to be in. I guess that's the new normal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, you're so right. You're so right. Oh, so exactly. <laughs> so before we get to Dam, I actually just wanted to ask about um, the day we didn't meet. Yeah. So I watched it recently obviously because it just came out recently but it was yeah. so good and I wanted to know like how did you guys film that did you was that during lockdown and did you do like the kiddies the young people the young scenes first and then the old ones was a location based I sorry yeah. a lot of questions in one but <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer all of them <laughs> so we shot that almost a week or two weeks after I wrapped from Dan oh okay so, um I was knackered. I think I went straight from Dam. I had a week off and then I went straight into the day we didn't meet. I was going through contact contract negotiations. I think my last or my second last day on Dam was going through sure. contract ne negotiations for the day we didn't meet. We It was only a two-week shooting period. So we shot the entire feature film in only two yeah. weeks. It was possible and doable because it's basically a two-hander, as mm. you saw. It was basically more or less just Stephen and I with Laudo and Jennifer and um, Francis coming in for a scene or two. So it was doable, but we worked like this. We worked so quickly. And we shot according to location, even <laughs> though there weren't that many locations. Mm. But all the kind of living room scenes, we did all of that in the same day. So we were jumping from past. We were jumping in between past and present, past mm. and present. But we had quite a good sense of the way that the characters spoke and felt. Um, so we could make, we could distinguish like that where, where we were in terms of our ages. And um, the wardrobe obviously helped and their mm. hair obviously helped. I don't know if you realized, but for instance, my character's hair was always down in the present and she always oh. wore her hair up in the past. And the wardrobe was also quite different. So that definitely helped to make that kind of mental shift. But the dialogue obviously also helped. Mm. Um, the way that they interacted with one another was very different in the past in comparison to the present. 
But um, so we shot shot according to location. So the living room scenes were all on the same day, the kitchen mm. scenes all on the same day, and that was just to save time with regards to setups because obviously lighting setups takes a while. Yeah. And um, and also according to availability, the other actors according to Jennifer's availability, Frances' availability, and Laura's availability. But it was so lovely to work with just Stephen and I because we we had such a good rapport and such a good mm. uh, friendship and chemistry that we ended up um, spontaneously uh, bringing in a lot of like dialogue, ad libbing a lot. Um, okay. I think. We gave Johan and the editors a headache afterwards because they had to cut around our ad libbing a lot for most of the time. So um, it came so easily working with him that sometimes it felt like I wasn't doing anything, you know, that I wasn't acting at all. <laughs> the cameras would stop or they would call cut and we'd both look at one another and say, oh, shit, were the cameras even rolling? What did we just do? <laughs> yeah, so it was lovely. And it was lovely going from damn mm. The day we didn't meet, because the day we didn't meet just felt so light, <laughs> you know, in comparison to them. It felt so light. It felt like a walk in the park. Like I could just be in love and heartbroken for two weeks. And it, <laughs> it was nice. It was a bit of a breather. <laughs> I know I, I I really enjoyed it and, and as you said because I was going to ask you about the dialogue was so good it was so witty and you guys had such great chemistry so it must have been like amazing so how much of it was your own like ad-libbing and how much was on on page um I would say we we, we kept to the script about 80 okay. percent in the actual final cut in the final cut, I think the script is about 80% the written dialogue and 20% our ad-libbing in the final mm. cut, i.e. the version that you saw. But when we were doing the actual scenes, I think some <laughs> of the scenes ended up being like 90% ad-libbing and 10% script. <laughs> Where the, the director, Johan, had to kind of like pull us in or rein us in and be like, guys, let's focus. Can we stick to the script? I don't know how I'm going to deal with you in the edit. <laughs> But they probably also help to like show your chemistry though, like yeah, I think so. because you have that kind of easy rapport. So I okay, let's so. okay let's talk about damn what we're here for. Okay. <laughs> oh, <no worries. laughs> so okay, so so tell us or the audience what damn is about. Before I start, have you seen it? I've seen two episodes. Oh, because I want to know what you thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have, um, I am very intrigued. I, I think I have so many questions, which I okay. assume you can't answer because it's probably spoilers. So I'm just going to have to wait until it comes out so that I can see. But it is so interesting. It is. It, I, I think I screamed about three times. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> it's, but, um, but no, it's really good. And it's, it's, I feel like it's unlike anything I've seen before. Yes. Okay, that's exciting. That's, that's very yeah. good. And tell me, do you want to keep on watching it? Yes, of course. I'm like, okay. why? Oh, I, like, obviously, I knew I had to watch it two episodes to talk to you. But then I was like, why did I watch this now and I have to wait to see the dance? Okay, that's I'm wonderful. not a patient person. Okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's good news. Then. So, so Dam is basically about my character, Yula. Her father passes away, and I'm not giving anything away because that happened in the first few seconds of the first episode. But so she comes home. She's been living in Chile, South America, for the past 10 years. She went there after school to go and study, but also just to get away from her family and from the small town, and especially the small town mentality. Mm -hmm. And then she comes back home to bury her father, and she lives in their old house, in the farmhouse where her and her sister grew up. And as the days go by, things start surfacing. And she struggles to distinguish between what's real and what's her imagination taking over. And the things that start surfacing is partly due to her traumatized past and the things that she needs to face that has now been triggered by her coming home. And then within that storyline, interwoven into her storyline are the other storylines of the locals within the town, like her sister and the other locals and the history that she has with them and the history that they have with one another and one or two strangers coming into town that she has encounters with. 
and their kind of backstories or backgrounds are also revealed as the series goes along. And um, so basically, it's just a web of secrets and a web of deceit that surfaces, but only to a certain degree and leaves you wanting to know more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is yeah. the problem I'm sitting with. <laughs> yeah. So what attracted you to the project? You said you haven't seen anything like it. Mm. And that was my feeling when I read the script initially. I haven't read anything like it. I really haven't. Mm. I was binging the scripts. I just wanted to read more and more and more and more. And my two audition scenes, this very rarely happens. But my two audition scenes, the one audition scene actually brought me to tears. Sure. And um, I just knew that I had to play her. I just knew I had to portray her. I loved her from the get-go. I mm. absolutely loved her because... Because Alex and I spoke about this often, the writer and the director, so I don't feel like I'm doing him an injustice by saying this, but he had a lot of coloring in to do. Mm -hmm. So in the script, when you read her, he felt unintelligible because it was almost like you couldn't understand why she was doing the things that she was doing, but reacting in the way that she was reacting. So there was a lot of like treasure hunting that I had to do mm -hmm. in terms of, like filling her in, finding her organs and why she did what she did and just coloring her in, you know? Mm. He gave me such a beautiful outline of what Yola was, but I had so much coloring in to do in a good way, um, in, an, in an exciting mm. way. And I loved, I loved her outlines. I loved the skeleton that he presented me with. And I wanted to do the coloring in. I wanted to find um, the reasons why she was doing the things that she was doing and reacting the way that she was reacting. But yeah, so what attracted me to the script, well, ugh, the project was the script and the story. Mm. Yeah. So I was, I noticed in the first episode, I think it was maybe like 15 minutes in and you still hadn't said a word. And like everything was just like, written on your face and there's many scenes where you're like alone and we just have to like sort of experience how you're feeling by your face so was that challenging like you had to <laughs> it's like you couldn't, you couldn't say like I am scared now or I feel this or yeah. It, yeah. Uh, like what was that like yeah so that's my favorite kind of acting <laughs> that's my favorite type of acting I love it I, I tend to I, I think actors of different styles mm -hmm. You know, and no one style is better than the other. It's just different. Um, like painters had to have different ways of painting. Actors have different styles. And that's my preferred style. That's kind of what I mm. love doing is just being and being in it. And just emoting through the eyes. I really love doing that because it, it means that you need to be fully present in the mm. moment. You have to be so present in the moment. You can't hide behind script. You can't hide behind actions. You can't hide behind anything. You just have to be so raw and so open and so vulnerable and so present. And I love that because it's so challenging. But to be fair, I, um, I confirmed the part in, I think, level four or level three of lockdown. And I knew we were only going to shoot in September. So I had a lot of time to prep. Oh. And I kept a journal for Yola. So I oh, journaled all her thoughts and I journaled her way of thinking about things and I journaled her feelings about the other characters, about the house, about everything. And I sometimes even like, you know, they call, um, I don't know if you are familiar with morning pages, but when you wake up, mm. the first thing that you do is you start journaling. That's what some people call morning pages. And I used to write or do morning pages as Yola. So I used to wake up and try and make myself think like Yola would think and feel what she would feel. And so she slowly but surely, and this sounds very um, otherworldly, but she slowly but surely started like creeping into my subconscious. Mm. It was just always there, you know? So when we actually got to set climbing into her skin, she was already there. I was already wearing her for quite a while. Um, so it came... It came very easily, but it's only because I had done the prep work. I had the time to do the prep work, which is most of the time we don't get that privilege in South Africa. It's like you receive the script and then you have to shoot tomorrow, you know? And I had the privilege of having a lot of time with her and I could just sit with her and just do the coloring in work um, in my own psyche. So, so when the shoot was done, how difficult was it to leave her behind? <sighs> I'm not being dramatic, but I had a bit of a panic attack. 
I can imagine. I had a bit of an I had a bit of an anxiety attack. Um, and it's just because it, you just have to purge, you know. Mm. It's, it sounds very dramatic, but it's what happens. So I'm just mm. calling a spade a spade. But I shot the last scene, and that was the last scene of the entire project. And I had spent eight weeks on set. Mm. I think we had like forty, uh, eighty-four shooting days in total. And out of that total amount of shooting days, I only had four days off. So I was on set being her. Sure. Or basically a whole of eight weeks. Um, So, yeah. So when Alex called, that's a wrap, and that's a wrap on Dam, I just stood there. And I I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And everybody just started packing up. And I just stood there with myself. And I was like, "I, I don't know how I don't know what to do now I don't know how to where must I go and 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 it you you lose that person you know Mm. like you have to mourn that person you have to you have to purge them and then I just I got very emotional um overwhelmingly emotional and um the head of department of makeup smarty she just came she just held me and she just rocked me and she just you know she was just Mm. hugging me and she helped me and i just had a very good cry and it felt like a purging um in that moment there and then and then afterwards i was like okay i need to now just put her to rest (laughs) but it's tricky it's very Mm. very tricky because you live that life you live that human being for two months i mean you eat breathe and sleep them you you especially because we were shooting on location so it's not like i came home Mm. to leah's space where leah lives and breathes you know i was living in the eastern cape which i started associating with your land with that world Mm. so yeah it's a process (laughs) sure so what is it like working with the other actors? Like, what is <gasps> it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's my favorite cast up to date. I swear. <laughs> I love every single person. And I've got the biggest talent crush. Seeing that your podcast is called, is called what, crushing are we, what are we crushing on? Yeah. Yeah, crushing on. Crushing on. Seeing that your podcast is called Crushing On, I have a talent crush on every single actor <laughs> in our cast. But can I just say, Faniswa, for instance, Faniswa Yisa, I saw her performing the first time they performed every day, every year I'm walking. And it's a theater mm-hmm. production that she did. But they've been performing that now, I think, for like a good 10 years or 12 years. No, even longer. The first time I saw Faniswa performing was when I was like 14 or 15. And I just fell in love with her. I was like, yo, this woman. And I was like, one day when I grow up, I want to work with her. And then I watched mm. Knuckle City and I was like, I still haven't worked with Faniswa. When am I going to work with Faniswa? And then she was casted as Lindy and I was like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. I think part of the reason why I do what I do is is um for the people. You know, like you're mm. all part of this bigger machine that's trying to tell a story trying to make everything work all the parts come together in order to tell the story so it's phenomenal and i always just try to observe and i always try to learn from my other actors you know because we've, we've all got such a different way of approaching it so, yeah. yeah from what i've seen like mental health is an issue for quite a few of the characters in them mm-hmm. so um do you think what do you like do you think there is a stigma around because there's so many scenes where people make comments like um she's just like her mother and you know like you know and it just it could almost you can almost feel like the the outsiderness that that yola deals with do you think that is something that that is prevalent or still prevalent today the stigma oh no i think there very much is i think there is a stigma around admitting to one's own demons Mm. Um, or let's not call it demons let's rather call it darknesses and as a human being we all have darknesses and we all have things that we struggle with and we all have parts of ourselves that are difficult not only to admit to others but also to admit to ourselves you know things that we I think it's about um, suppressing you know Um, like hiding away certain aspects of oneself that society doesn't necessarily deem normal Mm. and um yeah i definitely i don't know if i'm answering your question but i definitely think even in today's day and age we have this kind of culture of 
putting only our good foot forward and only showing the prosperous, happy, healthy mm. part of ourselves, especially with social media. And it's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. It's an mm. incomplete picture of what it means to be a human being. And um, I think especially in Dam, with Yola, when she's honest about her failings and her difficulties, instead of listening to her, they would rather shut her up and mm. tell her that she's mad, you know, which is the inverse of damn. Mm. Instead of going, oh, you're a broken human being because other broken human beings have inflicted pain upon you. And um, yeah, so I think it definitely speaks to a greater narrative of, of hiding away and oppressing our inner darknesses. Mm. Um, so I just, okay, I'm like to... So <laughs> when did the acting bug hit you? I know you come from an acting family, but you know, when did you know this was this is what I need to do? Ooh, um so after school I was fucking around quite a bit. Um I went and lived in, in South America for a year actually. And so I took two years off. Then I came back to ECT and I studied languages. I studied Spanish literature and gender studies mm -hmm. and English literature and linguistics. And then I was sitting in a linguistics lecture and I thought to myself, and this was halfway through the year, basically at UCT. And I thought to myself, I was like, okay, I was having a conversation with myself. I often do this. <laughs> I just have conversations with myself. And um, I was like, okay, Leah, this is like, this is very interesting. Linguistics, it's very interesting, but what do you actually want to do for a living? If you had to go on a daily basis, if you have to go to work, where do you want to be? As simple as that. And I was like, well, duh, I want to be on the stage or on set. I mean, that's obvious. But, ah, yeah, then you probably shouldn't be studying languages, should you? <laughs> no, probably not. And then I am finished my year because I wanted to carry those credits over. But then I applied for drama. And I knew that if I wanted to study drama, I was going to study at Rhodes University because I'm also a dancer with a dancing background and I wanted to specialize in physical theater. And at that stage, um, Andrew Buckland was still at Rhodes University and he taught me. So then I applied to Rhodes, finished my year at UCT, applied to Rhodes and then studied drama. And the rest is history. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love so that's why your, your Spanish is so good. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It all makes sense. I was like, yeah. this girl sounds native. <laughs> this does oh, not sound like... <laughs> yeah. No, I lived in, in South America for a year, so I'm fluent in Spanish. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah. so, okay. So this is the question we ask everybody. It's yeah. our closing question. But so who was Are we your... already closing? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's How half an hour. <laughs> We can chat more if you want to. <laughs> That's fine. I'll keep to your time. <laughs> so, who was your first celebrity crush? Oh, wow. I have like two or three. Go ahead. If that's fine. So, Shannon Sossaman, the actress from A Night's mm. Tale. Love her. And then, Julia Styles, 10 Things I Hate About You. Mm. And then Avril Lavigne, man, skater boy. I was going to say you had like a Heath Ledger thing going there. Yes. And you went to I Avril do, I do. Oh, I do. <laughs> I suppose Heath Ledger was actually my first <laughs> crush. <laughs> if I had to be completely honest. <laughs> Probably Heath Ledger. But then, um, yeah. And But Avril Lavigne was also a big, a big feature. She was my first CD that I ever received. So I listened to that CD day and night. That Skater Boy one. Skater Boy one, yeah. That was the first Iconic. Season. Iconic. Exactly. And she was just so rebellious, man. So rebellious and strong and punky. And I thought, oh, I want to be like that. So sassy. Mm, yeah. Shame I miss her. Um, no. Where is she? I'm going to go Google her after this podcast. You must Google. Um, the. Have you Have you heard about the conspiracy theory around her? No. You must Google um, Avril Lavigne, Melissa. People have this conspiracy theory that she, she died and was replaced by an actor named Melissa who looked like, just Google it. There's like a huge community of people that believe this. 
Oh my goodness, do you believe it? <laughs> no. I'm but... scared to start doing conspiracy theories because it's like a black <laughs> hole that I don't get out of. You know, like the one just leads to the other and then <laughs> all of a sudden I'm too scared to walk out of my own bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> but Leah, thank you so much for joining us. This was really lovely. It's a pleasure. It was nice meeting you. A nice meeting. Like I, I want to like put my hand out, and then I realize that we're on Zoom, and this is how awkward I am. But <laughs> yeah, but we can do a virtual elbow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. The pleasure. Let me know what you think once you've watched all eight yes, on Monday. I will. I will definitely. Awesome. Okay, bye. That was our interview with Leah. You can find her on Instagram at, at Vivier.lea. And you can watch Damn right now on Showmax. Um, the links will be in the show notes. So, as I said in the interview, I've only seen the first two episodes, but it's really well made and quite freaky and very interesting. And I'm I'm excited to see more. And let us know um, on social media what you guys think of the show. So before we go or head out and all of that, what have you been crushing on this week, Rebecca? Hey, I've been crushing on something called Crazy Mm. Ex-Girlfriend. I think, I'm not sure why Netflix advertised that to me, but I'm not going to ask any questions. Um, And it's like a musical sort of comedy. You might enjoy it as well. Yeah, it's a great show. (laughs) um i've been watching this um this new series that's that's coming out on wednesday called jenny and georgia and it's sort of like a um it it sounds very gilmore girls ish you know the mom was like young and like they moved to this new town because the mom wants to give the children like a better life after their stepfather passed away but it's it's it seems very gilmore girlsy but it says like a very 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 dark um underside so it's more like little fires everywhere so it's like it shocks you how dark it can get but yeah it's 10 episodes netflix releases it all at once and i was up to four o'clock in the morning watching episodes (laughs) of the show i was so invested that when it was done i was just like staring at the screen and i was like like what now it's like it was one of those type of situations there were people i was i was looking for there was couples that I wanted to get together that didn't get together. And it was like, yeah, it's just like very, I don't know how they managed to do it. In 10 episodes just get me so into this world. Um, yeah. But yeah, so. How, yeah. How many times has that happened where you start, you start out with the first episode and you're like, seriously, am I going to go, am I going to finish this entire thing? And then by the third episode, you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> cannot believe that this is still so amazing you know <laughs> it's happened so many times with me like crazy ex-girlfriend for example I, I was watching and like I I it just went into the, like kept going to the next episode and I was like <laughs> maybe I should check what episode I'm at now six or something I was on episode nine I was like at 4 a.m in the morning I, I low-key want to watch it again I don't have the time but I would love to watch it again I hope that Netflix can use it for a second season because so anyway, what keep a, like keep a watch out for that coming out on Wednesday, um, Wednesday the twenty fourth of February. In case people are listening to this later, but yeah, that's all from us. Um, me, you can watch at Karen Walby on Instagram at Karen Walby's with an S on Twitter, and sign up for my newsletter Wild Streams at wildstreams.substack.com. Follow us on YouTube at What's IJ and Crushing Are. And for, don't forget to tag us on Instagram when you listen to the podcast. And don't forget to watch Damn This Week. The podcast can be found at, at Crushing On Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at our website, crushingonpodcast.com. And send any feedback to crushingonpod at gmail.com. Join our Facebook group, Crushing On Club, where we chat about the show, celebrity news, recommendations, the whole shebang. Let us know what you think about what was discussed in this week's episode by sending us a voice note or email to crushingonpod at gmail.com. The show is produced by me, Karen, and Rebecca Barches. 
The show is edited and engineered by Rebecca Barches. Our logo was designed by Latifa Marouf. And the show was created in partnership with IGN Africa. If you like the show, tell everyone that you can any way that you can. Keep up to date with all our episodes by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate and review the episodes on Apple Podcasts as it helps others find the show. We'll be back next week with another in-depth conversation with a pop culture lover. See you then.